Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Today, the God of the open road is with us. The God of the twisting path is here. God of the narrow and upward way is here as we gather to worship. Again and again, we have come to this place. And again and again, we are gathering as community. And again and again, we are moving closer to our God. Again and again, God meets us here, fresh and renewed this morning. So we meet, we're heard, we show, we've shown the way. And again and again, we're going to worship our God. Today, as you're singing, Christ the Lord is risen today, Betty, this Betty, this Betty will play us songs. This Betty is going to come help me uh, redo the altar. And so you, I'm going to need you guys to sing and sing with all of your voice here. Um, you'll be singing Christ the Lord is risen today. And uh, I have one, two, and five. So while you sing, we'll redo the altar. And uh, so sing loud so we can hear you. All right? <coughs> pure. Forgive us when we avoid making any commitment to you, when we doubt that you really see our sin, when we disobey your commandments and are satisfied with only living for ourselves. 
Help us to walk in this world that would deceive us, where sin lures our spirits each day. Help us to move onward in your footsteps, treading as pilgrims on this earth, knowing that our home is above. Help us to be full of faith and hope and love as we do the Father's bidding. Faithful Lord, abide with us, for we shall follow where you guide. Amen. All right. Well, today we are still in, we are in the final uh, pieces of, of the Lenten season with Easter here. And so, today with Easter, where as on each Lent Sunday a light went out, today... So today, the light rushes back into our world again. The sun comes forth, the darkness has disappeared. Jesus is risen. If you could understand a single grain of wheat, Martin Luther tells us, you would die of wonder. Now we see those blades of grass coming up and emerging from the soil. We see the grass starting to, to green up as we watch in our days. And we're filled with awe at the new life that we see as spring approaches. And we grasp the overwhelming truth that our Lord is alive today on this Easter day. And we are unable to speak. There is joy. And it is joy that is inexpressible. But look, the... Look, the valleys shine with promise, and every burning morning is a prophecy of Christ coming to raise and vindicate every, uh, even our sorry flesh. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, and he too was made glad again. Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, obedient through his suffering, completing what he came to do. He reached the morning. And when he had offered all of, uh, that he had in a single sacrifice for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Then was fulfilled what was said of the Son, God has anointed you with the oil of joy and gladness above and beyond your companions. So today, this is a day of joy. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Would you join me in our prayer of illumination? So, holy God, as you have so often done again and again, open our eyes and ears, clear out the self-talk that keeps us from you, dust off the negativity and the distractions, and remove any doubt hindering our way in following you. Amen. Well, today we are at, uh, looking at the resurrection of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 11. And it starts out with sorrow that gives way to fear and great joy. When two women are sent by an angel to proclaim the good news to the disciples, Jesus is risen. And so here now our scripture from Matthew 28, verses 1 through 11. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, 
Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. When we read the scripture, we see the fear. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. When we think about Easter, we think about a time of celebration and joy of flowers and, and great singing music and, and, and all the hallelujahs and Christ is risen and all of the, the celebrating we do as Easter. But when we look at the first Easter, what we find is the first Easter begins with fear, great fear, fourfold fear. Now here's my working definition of fear. False evidence appearing real. Now I'll say that one more time so that you can grasp it. False evidence appearing real. Now what is false evidence appearing real that we see within this first Easter? Well think about it. Jesus was beaten barbarically and he was maimed mercilessly and, and buried haphazardly in a borrowed tomb. And so his ministry to many was spelled as over. His movement, finished. His cause, done. All hope, lost. Easter begins with great fear. Great fear among those who were following him. False evidence appearing to be real. Now the goal that I have for today is to take us from that fear and to replace it with faith. You see, what is faith? But faith is forsaking all and taking him, our Redeemer. Jesus is our Redeemer, and a Redeemer, I want you to remember this, a Redeemer is someone who takes beauty from the ashes, who makes beauty from ashes. Now, when we begin, we talk about fear. Fear, because that's how the first Easter began, with all of his his disciples, with the women, everyone was in fear. And we too live in fear. We try to deny it and we try to fake it and we try to stuff it. We try to do all kinds of things with it, but we live in fear even today. False evidence that appears to be real. A grizzly bear is behind every corner. Have you ever seen those commercials where they have the grizzly bear behind the corner? And he's just waiting to jump out. Well, there's a grizzly bear between, behind every corner in our lives some days. And it seems like every, we, we, we keep waiting for him to, to jump around that corner to bear his ugly fangs to, and to come along and chew us up and to chew up our family and our friends and our finances and our whole lives. We begin with fear because that's where they were. They were living in fear. Fear whispers incessantly, there's trouble out there. There's trouble that's coming. So don't, we don't sleep well, we don't eat well, we don't whistle while we work. And then when we find those people who whistle when they work, we give them the look. How many of you have ever had the look? You can't possibly be that naive. That look. We scold them. Haven't you read the news? Haven't you seen the reports? Haven't you seen the studies on all of this? Airplanes fall out of the sky and bull markets go bare and, and terrorists terrorize and good people turn bad and, and the other shoe is going to drop and, and before you know it, the fine print is going to be red and we're going to find that there's something that's been held back. Fear attacks us, and it uses two simple words. Anybody want to guess what those two simple words are? What if? What if? What if I don't close the deal? What if I don't get the bonus? What if she doesn't love me? What if he doesn't love me? What if my kids have crooked teeth? 
What if their crooked teeth keep them from being able to find friends and to get find a spouse and a career? What if they end up homeless on the street, sitting on that street corner with a sign that says, my, my parent never fixed my crooked teeth. It's all their fault. What if we're constantly being targeted by those what ifs in our minds and fear twists us up into pretzels? makes our eyes twitch it makes our blood pressure rise do you guys realize how many people out there are taking blood pressure medic medications we have an incredible amount of fear and stress and we our blood pressures rise our heads start to ache our armpits start to sweat stress and we live in fear. We not try to numb the fear with uh, six packs and food binges and too much TV. And we express that fear with volcanic anger targeted at others around us and silent stares. How many of you have ever given the silent treatment to someone? Well, you just stare. We're experts at those kind of things. But yet, when we think about it, help is on the way. There's a, a beautiful piece of art called the Eisenheim Altarpiece, and it's located in France. It's a 16th century altarpiece that was created for a monastery there in France that cared for people with skin diseases. And one of the important things that we need to remember about this piece of art was that, that Christ in, in the painting, in this beautiful altarpiece, has a skin disease. They wanted to show the patients that Christ understood where they were coming from, that he understood their fears, because they had a lot of fears about how this skin disease was going to affect their lives, whether it was going to kill them or destroy their relationships with, with others around them. And so the people at the monastery wanted them to know that Christ understood where they were in their fears. But we have those kind of fears too, don't we? We may not have a piece of art that depicts it, but we all have those fears of what it is that's going to kill us or destroy our relationships. Maybe it's taxes or cancer. Maybe it's loneliness or depression. Maybe it's divorce or debt or dementia or Alzheimer's or some other uh, ill in our world today. But, you know, whatever it is, Jesus understands it. Whatever that thing is that causes fear and anxiety in your life, Jesus understands. Now in the, in the altar piece, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there, and she knows all about fear. In the altar piece, Mary is there, and she's collapsed into the arms of John, and she's holding her son, Jesus Christ. The beloved disciple is there beside them, and she is living a mother's greatest fear. If you're a mother, your greatest fear is to have to bury your children before you. And so here she's living out this greatest fear of, of burying her son. Her son is there dying and di dead in her arms. The mother's, as a mother, she's, she's witnessing the death of her son, her dear son, Jesus Christ. And also on the painting, we see John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist is there, and he's holding a lamb. He's gently holding a lamb on the altarpiece. And we know that John the Baptist couldn't have been at Jesus' crucifixion because he was beheaded by Herod Antipas in 29 AD, long before Jesus was crucified. And so John the Baptist in the piece is there to witness to us to what he tells us in John 1.29, which is this, remember, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is there telling us, here is Christ, he is the Lamb of God, and he is taking away the sins of the world. Now there's an, another important piece that we need to be looking at, and we need to remember that what looks life-ending is really life-giving. What looks life-ending can really be truly life-giving. Yes, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And yes, he takes away the sin of the world. Yes, he takes away my sin and your sin and all of our sin, our ugly, rotten, putrid sin. And that's because Jesus is a redeemer. And you remember what I said a redeemer does? He makes beauty. He creates beauty 
out of ashes. Now in the Eisenheim altarpiece, there are two painted wings that also open up and they close over the central painting that like doors on a cabinet. And so when the wings are closed, the altarpiece shows the crucifixion. Christ is hanging there on the cross, his body covered with greenish hue to, to make it look like this skin disease that I described. He's, his body is covered with wounds. Here his sick body hangs, suffering, rejected, dying, death on a cross. But when you open up those outer wings of the Eisenheim altarpiece, and they're opened up at Easter, Christ bursts forth from the tomb, and it shows Christ being risen. Death has no more dominion over him, and Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And in this painting, Christ's hands are raised to the sky and, and blessing the word, uh, saying a blessing to God, and behind him in oranges and startling yellows and beautiful sunrise colors, a sun is rising towards the sky, and swirls of yellow and red and blue adorn Christ's garments. The outer wings of that, that altar piece, they are amazing when we look at them. And they show us the resurrection. But the, there's one more amazing thing about this piece, and that is the rubies. You see, the artist placed rubies in Christ's hands and his feet and in the place where he was struck with the sword. Rubies for scars. Jesus, our Redeemer, he creates beauty from the ashes. And the ashes that are his scars become rubies. Beautiful, brilliant rubies. The disciples and the rejection and the desertion, it finally becomes something new. The floggings, the mocking, it becomes new. The nail and the spears become rubies and beautiful. Finally, there is beauty where there was once ashes. Death is dead. Sin is forgiven. Hope is eternal. The victory is won, and what looks like a world-ending kind of thing now becomes a life-giving moment. And Jesus said it would happen. If you read Matthew's Gospel, you will find that five times in the book of Matthew, Jesus tells us exactly what is going to happen on this day. We, if we were good readers, we would have known what was coming, and so would the disciples. Five times Jesus says, I must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, be killed, and on the third day be raised. Five times he says this. Still, when we look at the Bible, we see that the disciples chose fear instead of faith. Here they had been with Jesus for this three years, walking with him and knew him personally. And yet, even so, they chose fear over faith. How easy it is for us to choose fear instead of faith. They had abandoned Jesus on that Thursday, and only one of them was there at the cross on Friday, John, the beloved one. And on Sunday, they were all hiding behind closed doors in the, in the upper room, afraid of what was going to happen to them. They were living in fear. And it was so easy for them to choose fear, to, that false evidence that appears real, instead of faith, forsaking all for him. Just ask Grisha Shiklinko. In 1960, an amazing event occurred in a small little village in the Ukraine. Grisha Shiklinko had appeared one day out of the blue, much to the surprise and shock of his friends and his neighbors. You see, everyone thought Grisha Siglinko had died in World War II. And here in 1960, here he is showing up finally in this village. And actually, the night that he marched away to go to war, instead of going to, the, to where he needed to go, he went home where his mother was. And she had made him a hiding place under a manure pile that was there on the farm. And so for 18 years, Grisha lived under that manure pile. 
In the winter, he nearly froze to death under that manure pile. In the summer, he nearly suffocated to death under that manure pile. But finally, it wasn't until 1960, 18 years, that he walked out from that manure pile, expecting to be prosecuted, punished, and placed in prison for failing to uh, be there at the war. His fears, however, were groundless because the statute of limitations had expired. And so here he was. He had been living in fear all this time. And fear will do that for us. We live in this fear for years and years and years. And what we end up doing is living under that manure pile. Then guess what happens? Life stinks. And I mean it really stinks. And how smart is that? For us to continue to give in to the fear. Wouldn't it be much better to live by faith? So listen, this is the angel's promise to us and to those who were there that day. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Did you get that part? Just as he said. We can trust what Jesus says because what Jesus tells us is the truth. I took away your sin. I conquered death. I'm alive, both bodily and eternally. I'm coming again to perfect your body and to restore the entirety of creation. When we hear what Jesus said, we need to let fear be gone and we need to live by faith. Do you know what the most frequent command in the Bible turns out to be? What instruction, what order is it, it given repeatedly by the prophets, by the angels, by Jesus, by the apostles? Do you know what it is? Any guesses? Be good, maybe? Nah. How about be holy? No. Maybe don't sleep during the sermon? Well, I'd like that one, but I don't think that was it. The most frequent command that's given in the Bible is this. Do not fear. Do not fear. That is written in the Bible 365 times. That's one time for every day of the year that we are being told not to live in fear. Not to fear, but to have faith in the one who is the truth the way, and the life. Faith, forsaking all, I take him, our Redeemer, our Redeemer who creates life from death, who brings joy from sadness, who brings beauty from ashes. And remember, remember always the rubies, those glorious, wonderful rubies. So what is it in your life? Has everything gone so terribly wrong? Don't fear. Are you sick? Don't fear. Is your heart broken? You know, there's no reason to fear. Whatever it is that is creating that fear, Christ is telling you, do not fear. I've got it. And remember this, and put this deep in the deepest, insidest inside you can find. I know that my Redeemer lives. And what else is there to say but this? Forsaking all, I take him. Forsaking all, I take him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right, so your questions to ponder for this week. How easy or difficult do you think that the women's message was to deliver? And do we ourselves have a message that we need to be delivering? In what ways do our fears keep us from knowing Christ personally? How do they stunt our spiritual growth? And why is the resurrection important? And how can we live out Res the resurrection in our own lives. Just some things to think about. Today we are participating in Holy Communion. So if you don't have your communion, please go get it really quick and we will 
begin with our Holy Communion. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and in the Holy Spirit. So on the night on which he gave himself up, he took bread and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to each of his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup and he took it and he blessed, get, he blessed it and said grace to God. And he gave it to each of his disciples and he said, drink from this, each of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread and the power of the Holy Spirit. Your church has continued in that sharing of the bread and the cup. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and vine that we are about to partake. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. If you would take your cup and on the bottom, if you'll pull off that little tab and you can get your little piece of bread there from it. Christ proclaimed God's grace to all in the breaking of the bread. Today, let us together partake in the body of Christ in remembrance of him. The body of Christ given for you. And now if you'll open your cup very gently. Christ proclaimed God's love to all whom he shared the cup. Let us join together as we too share in the blessing of the cup of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink together. The cup of blessing poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As the grain and the grapes once dispersed in the field and now united on this table in bread and wine, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we didn't start by, but let's go ahead and get um, our prayer concerns before we sing our prayer song. Who do we, what concerns or joys do we need to be aware of before we go into prayer? I would like prayers for my sister and her family. Um, my nephew, who had had heart surgery, passed away this Monday. Okay. What's your sister's name? Mary. Mary. Okay. Others? Well, if there are no others, then let us sing. If you'll open your hymnal to page 454, Open My Eyes and I May See. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 uh, before we enter into prayer. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses 
promises of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and let me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my eyes. Dear glorious God, on this Easter morn, we welcome you and Jesus into our lives. We welcome your resurrection, for it is a life-changing, life-giving, life-sustaining thing. We welcome the hope that it brings to our world, and we welcome the joy it brings to our darkness. We welcome the empty tomb, for we know that it means that you are on the loose in this world. Lord, may your resurrection give life to those who feel lifeless. May it give life to those who are just going through the motions and life to those who have faced death. Lord, may your resurrection give hope to those who are mired in despair, hope to those who feel hopeless, and hope to all those who have given up all their hope. Lord, may your resurrection give joy to those who feel no joy, joy to those who have lost their joy, or those who have had their joy snuffed out. Lord, unite our hearts as we pray for our world, as we pray today for your church throughout the world, that as we celebrate the feast of Jesus' resurrection, that we may renew our faith and strengthen our witness in Jesus' name. Today we pray for pastors and teachers and all those who lead in your church that they may be wise in leadership, humble in service, and fearless in the face of evil. We pray for the governments of our world and for their leaders that they may practice compassion and reject the politics that use death and suffering as a means of control. And we pray for our planet Earth that all people everywhere may be good stewards of its resources and share in its abundance. We pray for the poor and for the strangers, that they may receive a place of refuge and hope and hospitality. We pray for the sick and those in distress, that they may find healing for their pain and be restored to fullness of life. We pray for our neighbors, that together we may dwell in harmony and in love for one another, just as you have called us to live. We pray for our enemies, that we may love them as well, and be agents of reconciliation in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, may you be on the loose in this world as the risen, the risen one, and surround us and uplift us by your presence. Help us to pause in your presence always. Let us breathe in your spirit. Help us to wait and to rest in you. Healing and compassionate God, today we come before you as we turn our utmost concerns over to you, as we pray especially for Mary and for the family of Mary, for all those who are mourning a loss. We ask, Lord, that you would bring healing to them and comfort to their hearts, that you would touch them with your compassionate healing touch. Lord, we know there are others out there in the world who need your touch, who need to be in your presence. We pray for ourselves, we pray for all others in need, and for the joys and concerns that are occupying our thoughts those we've spoken aloud, and those we simply are pondering inwardly. 
We give you thanks and we ask that you be at our side each and every day guiding us as we walk this earth. Listening God, we know you hear our prayers. And so now and during this time, we lift them up to you in this time of silence. Oh Lord, we know that there is nothing that we cannot bring to you, no matter how big or small. We know that you hear our prayers. And so we ask today that you receive our prayers, the prayers that we have offered to you, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would use us for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout this time and our, this place. Holy in One, continue to be with us and to be the dwelling place of our minds, our hearts, and our souls, even as we pray, as we have been taught, saying together as one family, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Our closing hymn is on page 310. He lives. Let us sing it loud and boldly. He lives. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever foes may say. I see his hands of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me.
invited us to the empty tomb, the garden tomb, a place of great suffering, but yet a place of great love. And we have walked with him all the way to the empty tomb and to his resurrection. Let us ever walk with Jesus. As we leave this space, let us go and may our mouths speak of God's goodness. May our arms hold all those who are in need. May our feet walk towards justice. May our hearts know their worth. May our souls dance in God's, play, uh, in God's grace again and again and again until we come to that God's final promised day and that promised feast. And so in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, let us go with courage, let us go with strength and heart, and let us go in God's peace. Amen and amen. Thank you.